AMD's new AM5 platform has launched with the Ryzen 7000 series processors. Alongside upgrades such as PCIe Gen 5 and DDR5 memory support, the new platform ushers in brand new motherboards with a cohort of useful features. In this video, we're going to be taking a brief overview and first look at three of Gigabyte's AM5 motherboards. We've got the flagship X670E Aorus Extreme, we've got the X670E Aorus Master, and we've got the X670 Aorus Elite AX. We've covered the new AMD processors already and the AM5 platform in the launch day review, so make sure you do check out that content on YouTube or on the written KitGuru website. Like we said, this initial brief overview is going to be a first look at three of Gigabyte's AM5 motherboards and we're going to reserve some of the more in-depth review testing for future content, so check back for that. Let's start out with the flagship X670E Aorus Extreme. Appearance-wise, this £780 EATX motherboard is an absolute stunner. We get an overall dark black colour scheme with shades of grey and reflective elements on the PCB cover and heat sinks. Speaking of heat sinks, it's quite clear that Gigabyte has gone pretty crazy here, and crazy in a good way. Large slabs of metal cover the X670E chipset and four PCIe Gen 5 M.2 connectors, and you get an even taller, chunky cooling block for the primary PCIe Gen 5 M.2 device. Plus, a meaty rear I.O. cover with Aorus animated display sits above the well-designed VRM fin array that features a nano-carbon coating and an 8mm heat pipe. Underneath that MOSFET fin array, which does look to be highly proficient on first look, there is a pretty beefy power solution, so that's a direct driven 18 plus 2 plus 2 phase system. Gigabyte is using 105 amp power stages for the V-Core here, and that 18 stages on the V-Core is a direct driven, so there's no double in there. And this board is built on a 2x copper 8 layer PCB. One of the points that I really like is that the metal backplate makes contact with the rear PCB via thermal pad. So this means it's more than just a rigidity enhancer, and yeah, it clearly does enhance rigidity. But it also acts as a large, slim slab of cooling to sap some heat away from behind the MOSFETs. That's really good to see. And then when looking at the connection slots, we have a thick, armoured PCIe Gen 5 by 16 slot, this is where your graphics card will go. And given the way that modern GPUs are going with their cooling hardware, probably good that that's reinforced with some heft to it. Plus, all four of the dual channel DDR5 DIMM slots also feature metal bracing to enhance their durability. There are enough onboard connectors on the motherboard to keep probably even the most niche of use cases and users happy. If we start off, we've got six SATA connections, so that's probably fine when you couple in the ludicrous number of M.2 slots. There's a front panel USB Type-C header run at 20 gigabits per second. RGB and fan headers are plentiful and they're distributed really smartly around the motherboard, including different orientations. You've got right angle slots here, which is ideal for cable management. That's a really smart move. Plus, I like the inclusion of these diagnostic LEDs, onboard power button, and some voltage monitoring checkpoints. That's going to be really good for tinkering. And the rear I.O. connectivity is simply superb. There's plentiful USB Type-A connectivity, including QFlash Plus support. Plus, you get dual USB Type-C ports, one of which is 20 gigabits per second. Networking is very appealing, so you've got 802.11ax Wi-Fi 6E, and then you've got 10 gigabits Ethernet via a Quantia NIC. Video outputs, because the new Ryzen chips have an iGPU, come in the form of HDMI and DisplayPort, so you can use those for whatever means you have. And then there's a large QFlash Plus button, which could be useful if you're using a future processor that hasn't been released yet, as well as a large clear CMOS button, which I've just pressed and perhaps deleted all the data. Hopefully not. Probably haven't. It's not powered on. But these are really good, particularly for tinkerers and overclockers. Really easy to be able to press those back there and listen to that click. Glorious. Absolutely glorious. So that's the initial brief overview of Gigabyte's flagship X670E Aorus Extreme motherboard. This is one heck of a motherboard with a clearly overbuilt design and some outstanding specifications. 
But what if £780 for this caliber of hardware isn't within your budget? That's where the X670E Aorus Master comes in. So let's take a look at that one. Here we have the X670E Aorus Master. I think I pointed to the wrong board on the table earlier. I think I mixed up the two, but whatever. This is the Master. In terms of appearance, the EATX sized X670E Aorus Master shares many similarities with the Aorus Extreme sibling. The big difference comes in the price tag of a more tolerable £530 for the Master in the UK. There's a little more grey and a little less black on the heat sinks for this motherboard, but that doesn't really do anything to downgrade the appearance in my opinion. Still very good looking. Plus, it doesn't look like you get any massive downgrade in terms of performance. You're still getting beefy heat sinks along the motherboard. So yes, the extreme's going to be better, but this looks very, very competent indeed. The only other key difference is that the rear I.O. cover is torn down a little bit, but it still features the eye-catching Aorus branding. And it still sits atop a couple of sizable VRM cooling heat sinks. Speaking of the VRM, we get a twin 16 plus 2 plus 2 stage system, and this is built on an eight layer copper PCB. The V-Core VRM is a twinned approach, which means there's an eight plus eight setup using ludicrous 105 amp stages. That's just huge. And given the cooling equipped on the front and the rear side of the back plate of this motherboard, yeah, I think you're gonna be pushing pretty high currents through here if you have the CPU cooling to keep up. Slots are an area where this motherboard differs to its flagship sibling. Of the four M.2 connectors, two are now PCIe Gen 5 and the other two are Gen 4. In reality though, this is going to be absolutely fine for a significant cohort of the user base, even going into the future. You still get the thick reinforced PCIe Gen 5 X16 slot for graphics card usage. And there's also the PCIe Easy Latch Plus button for removing the graphics card inside a system. This is one of the innovations over the past few months that I really like personally. The dim slots, 24 pin connector and dual eight pins are all reinforced for durability. And you still get the pair of full length PCIe expansion slots along the bottom edge of the board. Much of the feature rich connector setup is retained with the Aorus Master considering the uh, features against its extreme sibling. The internal USB-C header is once again 20 gigabits per second. We've got another six SATA six gigabits per second ports for older SSDs or hard drives. Fan header setup is once again superb. We've got some along the bottom edge, right angled connectors, and then a bolt load up in the top right hand corner, along with the RGB LED headers. This is superb, uh, basically segregation of the headers, superb distribution, and really smart orientation. And then it's good to see the onboard diagnostic LED, the voltage reading points, and the onboard power button, which I absolutely love they've maintained their presence here. That's really good to see for Tinkerers. Rear IO connectivity is another area where the master differs to the extreme, but realistically the downgrades, if you like, are unlikely to be a concern to most users. Ample USB type A connectivity is maintained and we still get dual USB type C ports, one of which is 20 gigabits per second. That 10 gigabits per second USB-C connector actually doubles up for DisplayPort alt mode, so you can use it as a video output. And that goes alongside the full-size DisplayPort and the full-sized HDMI video outputs. Networking is an area where the master is downgraded versus the extreme, but it's still gonna suffice for the vast majority of users, I think. And that's because you get 802.11 AX Wi-Fi 6E alongside now a two and a half gigabit Ethernet connector via an Intel NIC. And the large clear CMOS button is dropped in favor of a sole QFlash plus button, which is a little bit more difficult to press, but realistically that probably has its benefits when you're fumbling around to stick a keyboard in the backside. So, yeah. So Gigabyte's X670E Aorus Master looks to be a really smart solution when focusing on its feature set that we've looked at in this brief overview. And we're factoring its price point of £530, which is expensive, but perhaps more tolerable than £700 plus. Maintains many of the sensible offerings from the Aorus Extreme, but it cuts down minor points in areas that are justifiable for the £250 price reduction. A high-end VRM setup, ample connectivity, and some really smart cooling designs. Yeah, we're looking forward to using this board a bit more in some more in-depth content in the future. But what if you want to spend a bit less money on a motherboard for your new AM5 platform and you simply aren't bothered by support for a PCIe Gen 5 graphics card? Well, that's where the £350 Aorus Elite AX can come into the picture. Starting out with appearance, we see Gigabyte continuing the blacks and greys of typical Aorus styling. 
This time, the motherboard is offered up in the standard ATX form factor that is more sensible at the price point than EATX is. The heat sinks still focus on the logical areas very well. We get a large slab for the X670 non-E chipset, and we still get a rectangular base cooling plate for the triple M.2 connectors, as well as the primary M.2 connector, which gets its own slab of metal. VRM cooling is handled by two large aluminium structures, one of which kind of doubles up as a rear I.O. cover. These two individual heat sinks are connected via an 8mm heat pipe as to share thermal load between them. The difference here is that Gigabyte opts for a bulky metallic structure instead of specifically a thin array. That should be pretty fine for a motherboard of this market positioning whereby you're not going to be pushing a 16 core chip to the extreme with liquid nitrogen or something like that. Plus, there's a lot of bulk to these blocks of metal, and there is some intention to increase the surface area. So yeah, I think this is probably going to be sufficient, but we'll have to do more testing in the future. The power delivery setup is built around a twin 16 plus 2 plus 2 VRM design. And once again, it's twin because those 16 V core stages are doubled. So you get 8 plus 8 in parallel, but you get 16 stages at 70 amps rated. And this is all put together on the 8 layer copper PCB. Focusing on the slots, once again we get quadruple M.2 connectors, but here comes a key difference for X670 non-E. Only the one slot supports PCIe Gen 5 SSDs, whereas the other three support PCIe Gen 4. Plus the other area that differs to X670E on this non-E motherboard is that the primary PCIe expansion slot is now an X16 Gen 4 rather than Gen 5. Gigabyte also switches up the easy latch design here, so we no longer have the plus. Instead, we've got a large tab to try and maneuver that graphics card out with slot. And given the surrounding heat sinks, that's probably a pretty good solution in my opinion. For the internal connectors, it's good to see the front panel USB type C header included. And once again, this is 20 gigabits per second speed rated. Now we get four SATA 6 gigabits per second ports, but coupled with quadruple M2s, I think that's probably fine. Let me know if you agree. And we get five four pin fan headers spread around the motherboard, as well as five RGB headers. One area that really impressed me is Gigabyte's continued inclusion of onboard buttons for power or clear CMOS. They're really useful alongside the onboard LEDs for boot or DRAM, for example. If you like USB ports, you're gonna love this rear IO. There's a truckload of type A ports in addition to the single 20 gigabits per second type C. Video output comes in the form of a single HDMI connection. And networking is what I would consider to be the ideal mainstream setup currently. 802.11 AX Wi-Fi 6E and 2.5 gigabit Ethernet. And once again, we see the Q flash plus BIOS button, which is going to be useful in the future, no doubt. So Gigabyte's X670 non-E Aorus Elite AX looks to be a somewhat sensibly priced mainstream offering for the new AM5 platform, so I think this will appeal to quite a lot of people. You get a whole host of healthy features, quadruple M.2 connectors, a beefy VRM solution, and dual 20 gigabits per second USB Type-C. So yeah, we can imagine this board will tick quite a few boxes at £350 in the UK. So there we have our brief overview for a trio of Gigabyte's new M5 motherboards. I sincerely hope I don't bump and drop anything because these boards are not cheap. Let us know what you think of the hardware in the comment section down below. Are there any features you particularly like or any hardware inclusions you'd like to see? Let us know. Like I've already said, make sure you check back in the future for more in-depth, proper review content in relation to these motherboards and some of the other AM5 motherboards, as well as hopefully the upcoming B-Series chipset on AM5. And as always, if you like this video, give us a like and subscribe, do all that YouTube stuff, really helps support the Kikuru channel. Check out our main page on the Kikuru website, buy a cool t-shirt, interact with us on Discord and the likes, and I will catch you in the next one.